Hi, it's Dr. Noel Williams, Optimal Health Associates. I'm not going to give a talk about COVID on this one. I'm going to give a talk about depression, but one of the reasons I wanted to do a review of depression was because of COVID, because I see a ton of people with either just mild COVID who end up feeling depressed, anxious, or with fuzzy headedness, or people with long haul who do it, who get it. And, but again, Inflammation causes changes in your neurochemicals. So COVID releases a ton of inflammatory mediators. They cross into the brain and have effects. Just like if you get a head bonk, you get a concussion, you're at high risk for depression or anxiety. Um, you have a stroke, lots of different things. But how do we feel on a day-to-day -day basis emotionally is this complex interaction of neurotransmitters. And the number one neurotransmitter that is important in our brain is called glutamate. Glutamate, glutamate, glutamate. No one ever talks about it because there hasn't been a big pharma intervention for it until recently. So they talk about it a little bit more and I'm gonna go back to that. But there's really three or four in particular that I think are essential for our global understanding for depression. And the first one, serotonin, which is think of it as calming. Second is dopamine, which is activating. Third is norepinephrine, which is activating. And fourth is gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA, which is more sedative or calming. So when we kind of define each one, it's important to know where they come from to an extent. And so everything about depression, this is the first thing in adults and adolescents, everything about depression and anxiety, all of it has to do with serotonin synthesis. So serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter, comes from the conversion of tryptophan, the amino acid in Turkey, turning into serotonin. There is a middleman per se on that, or an enzymatic pathway that is driven by methylfolate, or methylated folic acid. And so we have to understand this key concept because as you don't methylate your folic acid, you don't produce serotonin. And the issue with that is there's genes that do that. So now imagine your liver's in the middle, folate comes in through food on that side, and it's biologically inert, essentially. It goes through the liver. There's this evil little enzyme called methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, MTHFR, which some people now have more heard of, but we've been dealing with MTHFR for about 15, 16 years. Um, it adds a methyl group, which is a carbon and two hydrogens. So folate leaves as methylfolate, thanks to methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. Once that methyl group's on it, the wrapper's off the chocolate bar. It's active, it can do stuff. The methylfolate crosses a placenta, protects the baby. So when you hear about, oh, folic acid's really important to prevent miscarriage and vascular events and all this stuff, it's the methylfolate that does that. Because if you don't have methylfolate, you you get inflamed, which I'm going to get to. So anyway, but the methylfolate comes over your liver, or comes over the small intestine, and it's the cofactor between tryptophan and serotonin. That's a little simplified because the methylfolate goes through some other steps, but that's essentially what happens. Serotonin is made in your gut because you need serotonin for your gut to work. Which, if you're ever like really stressed and anxious, you feel sometimes nauseated. It's serotonin stuff. And people with chronic anxiety have stomach stuff because it's serotonin stuff because they don't have enough serotonin in their gut. They don't have enough serotonin in their brain. So it's, it's about production. And the issue is that only 10% of the population essentially is autosomal dominant for the genes that methylate folic acid. So lo and behold, 90% of us have some level of deficiency. And you kind of always break it up into like 90, 80, 70, 60, down to about 30. And so, but there's two main genes. There's a, there are three. There's an autosomal dominant. There's an autosomal recessive, and there's an autos, and there's a variant. So I kind of look at it to an extent like you can get. If you have two dominants, you're going to be at 100 percent. If you have a dominant and a variant, you're going to be you know somewhere between 80 plus. If you have a dominant and a recessive, you're probably going to be at 75. And you kind of mix and match those on all the way down. Um, and so. As you have less methylfolate production, you have less serotonin. And just keep that in the back of your mind because it doesn't become important really till teen years. Why? Because when we're little kids, we're babies, we're driven by 
gamma amino butyric acid. I mean, sure, we have serotonin. Sure, we have norepinephrine. Sure, we have dopamine. But we have human growth hormone. And the interaction with human growth hormone and the brain, it leads to production of tons of gamma amino butyric acid or GABA, which is calming. So when you see a little kid running around silly, think, yeah, they have serotonin, but no, they have GABA. And when, what do we, th we think about GABA for medically in terms of drugs? Xanax, Valium, Tamazepam, all the sedative hypnotics. They bind to the GABA receptor. What works best? Having lots of your own, which is why little kids are little kids. They have that. That is, that is a key thing. And that the GABA cycles into the glutamine glutamate pathway also, and it gets all very complex. But the bottom line is, Having GABA is important. And so as we age, the GABA starts to fall because eventually we, get, we have a lot from human growth hormone. We can get more from testosterone and DHEA, which are hormones we get in adolescence. The bad mood though, this is a key concept, key. Why do girls have more bad mood than boys in adolescence? Very simple, it's methylfolate. They have estrogen, they produce a lot more estrogen than boys. And so estrogen gets metabolized in the liver and when the liver's metabolizing estrogen, it, it doesn't methylate folic acid so they make less serotonin. So what's the number one side effect of an oral birth control pill? It's mood disturbance, it's mood disturbance. And it's because you're taking this big dollop of estrogen, the liver has to metabolize it. There's other consequences, but it has to metabolize it. It can't methylate the folic acid. It's B vitamin activation. So you add a girl who has you know, a 75% rate of methylization, you knock her down to 30 or 40, all of a sudden she's in a bad mood. Plus she loses her testosterone because birth control, as I always jokingly would say, you don't have to worry about getting pregnant because you're never gonna think about having sex again because you don't need testosterone, but that's a separate, separate subject, but you know, I always ramble. So the bottom line is this, methylization is a key thing and as methylization of folate falls, mood goes awry. But so as you get into your late teens, you're, Human growth hormone starts to go down. Testosterone starts to go down a little bit, not horribly, but a little. So you become serotonin dependent and your methylization rate comes up, it plays a big role. And so in the end, that's why depression starts occurring in younger women in their early to mid twenties and boys classically in their mid to upper twenties or early thirties because of the methylization. Now, the other thing that plays a role with methylization is some dopamine production, phenylalanine to dopamine, and not as much with norepinephrine. And so that plays a role too. And so when we're thinking about why people get depressed and anxious, it's a balance between all of them being just right, so you feel happy and elated, you respond appropriately. And so when we're thinking about how to treat people with depression, we have to use the basis of this for success. And then we have to go back to glutamate and when the glutamate levels go either too high or too low, people can get very anxious or melancholic. And, and that then becomes a catastrophic potential event. And so that then goes, well, what can we do for that? Well, glutamate has a receptor called the N-methyl-D-aspartate receptor. So the N-methyl-D-aspartate, N-M-D-A, N-methyl-D-aspartate. Okay, I said it right. So anyway, that took me a long time to learn many years ago. And so where does CBD come in? Well, CBD affects and normalizes per se, we'll, we'll use that word, the N-methyl-D-aspartate receptor so it can provide resolution of se severe anxiety and depression in some patients. Now, the thing is too, when you think about how serotonin gets in to, so you make serotonin in your gut, it floats around in your platelets or, or in other systems to, or in your bloodstream to get somewhere, it crosses your brain, gets into your brain, then it has to cross first into the cell, and then it has to cross from the cytoplasm of the cell into the nucleus, there's proton channels, and of course those are genetically wired too. So you have to, the serotonin has to get into the cell, into the nucleus, and then into the receptor. Well, if you have protein channels that aren't that good for serotonin to pass through, you have mood disorder. So even if you're methylating. So then you have to think, well, what's an end around? Well, CBD uses different protein channels and can get in there and bind right next to the serotonin receptor, as does THC. So you can get similar effects to serotonin with CBD with low amounts of THC, depending on what kind and all that rigmarole. So that's the role. Who figured that all out? Well, that would be the NIH, and they patented it in 1999. It's very easy to find. I've put some posts on about that many 
many times over the years. But, um, and then they blocked all research on it because they didn't want to have an effective tool to treat the n methyl d aspartate receptor because God forbid we get rid of depression and anxiety. So instead we have to, had to wait till CBD was allowed. And so what people will hear about now is called ketamine. Ketamine was an anesthetic agent. It was, um, or is an anesthetic agent. But what is it really? It is PCP light. It has, you know, about 10 or 15% roughly of the activity of PCP. PCP was an anesthetic agent in the 50s. It was fabulous. But every now and then it went awry and people went cray cray because it's PCP. But what does it do is it totally blocks the N-methyl D aspartate receptor, which can then reverse how people, or make people unconscious, but then also can make them feel better. But it would be too much and too much blockage or too little blockage. And it's this very complex thing and you go, you feel kooky and horrible and lousy. Well, ketamine, what happens when you give ketamine infusions, you get a partial block of the N-methyl D aspartate receptor or the glutamate receptor. And by doing that repetitively, weekly, for you know, six, 10, 15 treatments through an IV under the uh, supervision of an anesthesiologist, you can get refractory, depressed, melancholic, or anxious people much, much better. It also can be used for pain relief and other stuff, but our focus is depression and anxiety. So you can fix those people that way who failed everything. The tragedy is ketamine wasn't around until the last, you know, we started, I started first referral for it was probably about eight or 10 years. Now there, there's ketamine clinics all over the place. But the we could have been using CBD long before this, and now at least we have ketamine and CBD. So then the summary is, you have all these neurotransmitters. So the unified theory is balancing the neurotransmitters, but you have to balance them at the beginning. And you have to balance them first by making sure your serotonin production and your dopamine production are maximized naturally by methylated folic acid. So there's a variety of tests you can do. You can look at homocysteine, uh, which is if you don't methylate your folic acid, you spit out homocysteine, which is a, causes inflammation in your blood vessels. Um, the other thing that happens, I won't go into the other thing, it's, I don't wanna get too convoluted, but the bottom line is you can look at a homocysteine level, which can be high in someone with uh, poor methylization, uh, but if their folic acid is low, they, they don't spin off as much methylfolate, or sorry, they don't spin off spin off as much homocysteine because as your folate levels go up without methylization, you spit out homocysteine instead of methylated folic acid. So you can do homocysteine or you just do a methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, a reductase gene test, an MTHFR. And if you get that test done, you'll see your methylization level, well, not your levels, but your recessive autonomal, all of that stuff. And your doctor can help you figure out what that means. Now, not all doctors can figure out what that means, but it's not hard. <laughs> you, get to go, you go onto the computer and you put in the gene and it will tell you. It's very easy. I mean, I can remember it because I do it all the time, but the, it's not hard. It's five minutes I have, or less. And tons of patients have done, brought me their results in and already know what they all mean. So I'm always like, great, I'm glad you know. So the thing is, so you have to do methylization of folic acid and that's going to solve a tremendous number of people's problems with mood disorder. It probably runs about an 80% improvement rate to success rate. Um, then you have to start looking at things that slow serotonin breakdown and slow norepinephrine breakdown. And so those are medicines. There's not supplements for that. Things like uh, Prozac, Zoloft. And people complain about those. I've used those thousands and thousands of times with methylated folic acid. We've had great luck taking care of people and getting people cured with depression, not always, but a huge amount of time. So you can use medications to slow the breakdown. And that's a key concept that medicines don't make you produce more neurotransmitters. They keep the neurotransmitters you have around longer. So if you're not making them, they don't work so well. So methylization of folic acid, Vitamin D, vitamin D is an essential component of mood because if it, you have vitamin D, you're gonna make, your brain is going to work better and you're not gonna catabolize your serotonin as, as much. And then third, fish oil, uh, a noted antidepressant because it gets inflammation out of your brain. So we want inflammation out, methylfolate production in, and then we'll have more serotonin and dopamine, and then hopefully we can feel better. But then if we don't, we have to go to medicine. But think that whole basis of this is the drop of gamma butyric acid. And so then the final leg of this concept is what do hormones do? Well, hormones can help your GABA go up. So progesterone kind of works when it's natural. 
it kind of stimulates the backside of the uh, GABA receptor to cling onto your own better. Think of a pregnant woman who's glowing, who's like, oh, she feels the best she ever did. It's a GABA effect from the progesterone affecting the back of the receptor to make it cling on better. So it makes GABA turn into natural volume even more effectively. Um, and then if you look at other related things like testosterone and DHEA, they can help human, uh, GABA production. Human growth, horm human growth hormone can help uh, GABA aminobutyric acid production. And sometimes some morelin or human growth hormone releasing hormone can too. Again, all different strategies to get people better who are having a hard time. So that was very off the cuff rambly, but I hope Kim that made a little sense. Yeah. So anyway, think the brain's complicated and you have all these neurotransmitters going all these different ways. But the bottom line is if you can tell anyone anything, if they're having difficulty with anxiety and depression, get on methylated folic acid. Get on methylated, it's over the counter, usually I think one milligram or two milligram. The prescription versions are seven point, or I think 3.5, 7.5 and 15. Um, so again, and they're, they're prescriptions, but they're medical foods. And so the problem with that is they're not covered that well by insurance, but we still use them constantly because they work like the bomb most of the time. So anyway, that's it. A lot of stuff. Bye.